In this week's episode of Hockey Inside Out, we ask our panel to play GM and reshape the Canadians into a Stanley Cup contender. How hard can that be? Welcome to this week's show. I'm Adam Susser. Joining me today is Stu Cowan, Chris Nyland, and CBC Daybreak's Jessica Resnack. Here's what we're going to be talking about on today's episode. Number one, placed on the right wing during practice, should Jonathan Durant stay there for the rest of the season? Number two, will the Canadians ever land a legitimate number one center? Number three, if you were Mark Bergevin, how would you reshape the Canadians into a Stanley Cup contender? Number four, how do you explain the Canadians getting more than 50 shots on goal in three games this season? and only being able to win one of them. And number five, who has been the most surprising, pleasantly surprising Canadian for you this season, assuming you've been pleasantly surprised at least once. Let's start the show. During Tuesday's practice, Jonathan Dre was finally moved from center to right wing. That's right, the Habs decided to take a gamble and put Dre back in the position that he's played during his whole professional career. Bold move, Montreal, bold move. Talk about thinking outside the box. If you're a Habs fan, 2018 starting off with a bang. I can't wait to see what other crazy plans Marc Bergevin and his people have in store for the Canadian fans for the rest of the year. Okay, uh, that's, that's the end of that sarcastic mini rant. I feel slightly better. Uh, do you think Jonathan Duran should stay on the wing for the rest of the season? Well, it only took them 44 <laughs> games to figure out that he's not ready to be a number one center. Yeah. Uh, now the number one center is Jacob De La Rose, you know, whose stick is where goals go to die, basically. So, um, <laughs> It's, uh, he probably should stay there. I mean, it, it just didn't work. And it's not Jonathan Drouin's fault. I mean, he, he was a winger in Tampa. He's more comfortable on the wing. He tried his best at center. He said all the right things. He tried. He was terrible in the face-off circle. But put him on the wing, give him some freedom, leave him there the rest of the season. And I think now, maybe now, Mark Bergerman realizes he has to go get a legitimate number one center because Jacob De La Rose, uh, we'll see how that works. I mean, it would have been nice to have Dano or Shaw maybe available to try out that experiment. Well, we'll see what the new Logan Shaw has to bring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the guy they picked sure. up off Wager. And his two goals and his 23% the <laughs> face-off uh, success, yeah. But when um, they had the press conference in the summer when they traded for Jonathan Drouin, the question was, will he be playing center? And Mark Bergevin said, yeah, we'll try him out. But he didn't make it seem at that point that this was his position and we're going to live and die with it. So I thought it was weird just how stubborn he was for so long when they saw it wasn't working out. He went 13 games without scoring a goal, put this guy on the wing, and give him some confidence, let him help contribute to the team, and you know, it could be a difference maker. Yes, you wanted him to be the center, but it was pretty obvious that this was not going to work, so why don't you get a really good winger instead? Mark Bergevin is stubborn. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, well, you know, it, it, it's good he's back there because it didn't work out, obviously, and whether it was 20 games or 40 games or 10 games, it didn't work out, and now they put a guy, Jacob Delarose, between him and Galchenyuk, uh, kind of like uh, a babysitter in the defensive zone, basically. <laughs> yeah. And because uh, those two guys, are, again, they're horrendous in their own end. I can't believe how long they've been in this National Hockey League. And never mind that center ice position. I know it's difficult to play defensively and play that 200-foot game as a center. But these guys even have difficulty getting the puck out of their zone when they're on the wing. And I worry about that, too, because D-men pinching all the time, uh, they're going to cough up pucks on the wall. They're not consistent defensively in their end. And like I, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. It would be nice to see Galchenyuk back at the center ice position uh, because the season is basically lost. Play him and live with those mistakes. There's going to be a lot of them. And I don't think the coach wants to put him there because – the fact that he thinks he's still making a run for it. And uh, with Alex, I don't think the offensive upside out, outweighs uh, his uh, ineptness in the defensive zone. I think it's the GM who doesn't want to put him back at center. I mean, we're talking oh, yeah. about yeah. stubbornness. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, you know, he, no said, he said at the golf tournament he can't play center. And I'm like, why not try him now? Like, it's just, yeah. it's just yeah. a case of stubbornness, I think. That's the only reason why Alex Galchenyuk, they won't try him there. I mean, he's not... Him and Drouin together combined minus 39. They both struggled offensively, but... 
But I hope the GM also learns from the Alex Galchenyuk situation and carries it into Jonathan Drouin. Just make a decision or just don't put so much pressure and say this guy's a center and then take it back and say mm -hmm. actually he can't play center. Do you think we'll see a difference in Drouin now that he's on the wing for the first time with our, the Habs? I think we might. He might be more comfortable. He was, t t I was talking to him after practice the other day and he was saying well, after the change was made and he said offensively it's not a big difference center or wing. He says you sort of roam around the zone, you get open, you go, he says it's in your own end. And you know, De La Rose, as much as Claude Julien talked about how De La Rose has some offensive potential, but he played pro when he was like 17, 16 or 17 in Sweden and they turned him into a, before then he had some offensive skill and they put him on the fourth line and taught him to be a defensive forward, which he has become, but he hasn't shown me any hands. I mean, when he gets, he had a chance, he had an, either he misses the net or he hits the goalie right in the belly. So Yeah, he's not great offensively, yeah. but again, I think they're going to Boston, like I said, babysit in uh, the defensive zone. And then, you know, uh, he's not a bad player. Like, we always judge players mm -hmm. on goals and assists. He's not an offensive guy. He's never going to be. But uh, he certainly is one of those players that can help a team, uh, you know, when you're looking at uh, third and fourth line players. He's one of those guys, and he's a responsible player on the It's edge. interesting. He's been worse than Drew on the face-offs this year. He's like 38% in the face-offs. He reminds, Delos reminds me of that beautiful thoroughbred racehorse who <laughs> can't win a race. I mean, he's a big, tall, good-looking kid. He can skate. He's got the hair flowing. He's got everything going, but offensively, no, maybe now. Maybe we'll see. Maybe you will do something with Galchenyuk and, and Drouin, but I'm, I'm not very optimistic. Okay, so the Drouin at center experiment is over. Uh, before that, it was Galchenyuk. Do you think the Canadians will ever find a legitimate number one center? They have to. <laughs> they, that's what it's coming down to, but it's getting ridiculous. How many years has it been, no matter who the GM is, that they're constantly looking for centers, since other teams can go out there and find it, but it's just, they either have to choose that they're going to draft and sort of have bad years so that they can put themselves in order to draft a really good centerman or trade a good piece and you have to live with that trade to get a centerman back. Um, you know, we've talked a lot of times about the possibility of trading Carey Price because that's someone that you would have to move to possibly get that legit number one center. But then you also have to have a goaltender that you're ready to pass the torch to. Could Charlie Lindgren be the guy? That's the kind of a decision they have to make. Yeah, the team that's been looking for a number one center for so long, you wonder maybe going into a draft one year, you know, line up who the best like six <laughs> foot and over 200 pound centers are in junior and draft one in every round, the best one and have like seven of them. Uh, but uh, they, they have to. I mean, you, it's been shown in the NHL you can't win if you don't have strength down the middle with a number one center. Well, none of the previous GMs have done it either. No, I know. That's right? what I'm saying, yeah. yeah. So uh, there has to be something in that. And yeah, there are some GMs who've done it. We, we look poil. Uh, uh, down in, in Nashville, uh, he gave up some pretty good pieces mm -hmm. to get those players. And again, you got to be ready uh, to give up the the piece pieces from your core, uh, not just one, maybe two, and draft picks to get a player like that. And if you don't draft them, that's how you got to do it. So, uh, is he going to do that? Is he going to make that that deal before trade deadline? I don't believe he's gonna. Uh, I just don't think. Uh, with a, a season that I believe is lost right now, it would be a good move. Uh, I, I would want to move some players. If you're going to retool this thing, move some players out and get some draft picks. But you're saying it's been so long. I mean, it goes back to Saku Koivu, and I'll never say anything bad about Saku Koivu. He was an amazing player, but he wasn't really a number Everybody one was center. Small. <laughs> he was small, and he was he was in that number one center role for so long. And on on a really good team, he'd be your number two center and be one hell of a number two center. And and it goes back. I mean, Bobby yeah. Smith, Bobby Smith, Vinny Damfus were like the last. You know, and and Sir Savard, when he talks about that, you're the one that cup one. He says the, the key piece, that was, was the, the, the missing piece. piece was Bobby Smith. And Sir Savard said he wasn't the best player on the team. He was wasn't the, the most physical player on the team, but he was the big centerman they needed down the middle, and he said that was the key piece to them winning the cup. Yeah, I don't know, Chris. Season lost. If they can just get by with only losing seven games, they should be able to eke into the playoffs. Yeah. Uh, okay, <laughs> I want you guys to play along here. Close your eyes for a moment. You can do this at home as well. Uh, picture yourself significantly uh, better dressed than you all are currently. <laughs> Who are you? You're, you're a GM, Mark Berenstrand. <laughs> what are you doing to reshape the Habs into a Stanley Cup contender? I'm shopping Carey Price. And I, I think it, I think it'll be hard with that eight-year contract that kicks in next season. The fact there's a no-trade clause, 
But as, as I've said before, this team has not won anything with Carey Price, and that's not Carey Price's fault. He can't score. They have all this money invested in a goalie on a team who can't score. And, and that sort of makes me wonder, you know, when, when they traded PK, always oh, an offensive liability. Well, you have the best goalie in the world behind them. That's, you're a team that can afford to have guys with offensive liability. That is why he got traded. No, that's not why he got <laughs> traded. No, <laughs> but I'm just saying, but you can afford uh, a team that no. the Canadians, with Carey Price in net, you should be able to play an open, freewheeling mm -hmm. style because you got Carey Price in net, but they've got Carey Price and they play this conservative, even Jonathan Drouin said how the system here is much more conservative than what he played in, in Tampa, but I just think... Well, a lot better players in Tampa. Well, that's true, too. Jonathan. That's true, too. That's true. you got to play the cards you're dealt, but um, yeah, it, it's... I think Carey Price is the guy you're going to get the most for, but again, he's got a no-trade clause, and, and that contract is a lot for another team to take on. And he's really the only guy that you could get something from that he, other teams would be interested in him, and you can get a lot back for him. Um, but they're not going to do that. And I think that was the problem, too, is that Mark Bergevin said that he won't trade Carey Price. But you have to now look at what's the best thing for this team going down the future because Carey Price is going to be 31 in August. He's not getting any younger. Uh, you know, let's see what you can get for him, and that's probably the only way that you can make a major shakeup on this team. And you've got Charlie Lindgren. I mean, it's not a huge – he hasn't played all that many games in the NHL, but it sure looks like he can play in the NHL. Yeah, I, I don't want to be Mark Bergevin. Uh, I, I'll be me. If I was <laughs> taking over and I was going to retool this um, or rebuild this organization, I would certainly have everybody – uh, on the table as far as availability. Uh, I uh, look down the road and see what players are coming up in the draft, what years, and try and plan it out. Uh, so when I move players, I'm, I'm not just getting picks, I'm getting picks that are gonna benefit me down the road and get me the players I need to turn this thing around and eventually get this organization back where it belongs, not you know, maybe we'll make it this year, or, or maybe we'll spend uh, that eight million, or maybe uh, we'll get that sentiment at some point. Uh, I, I'd, I'd put everybody on the table and and rebuild this whole thing from scratch. Brush, brush up on your French a bit. Maybe you'll get the job. We oui, win. Oui. We oui, win, oui, Michel. Oh, no, I won't say that. That was really good. That was impressive. I would love to be in a press conference with Chris as the GM. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Monday night at the Bell Center, the uh, Canadians outshot the Islanders 56 to 24. It's the third game this season. They've had 50 plus shots on net. You've only been able to win one of those games. How do you explain that? Whoop de do. Uh, you <laughs> exactly. Know, here's the deal. At the beginning of the season, if you watch this team and looked at how they were playing, they were t playing high risk hockey. They were pushing the pace. They were out shooting every team. Every team, every game. They had the most shots in the NHL of any team. And they were losing hockey games. They weren't getting the goaltender. Uh, they became a little bit more conservative, trying to get back to 500. They started trapping again, and which is fine. That transition game, you got to go once you pick up the puck. But I, I get a kick out of people talking about this team not being able to play offense and all this. And when they have the puck, they're allowed to go. They have the freedom to do what they want. They pinch. They go. They just don't have the horses. And when. You get that many shots and you play that high-risk hockey, you're, you're going to get in trouble at times. We saw it the other night. Odd man rush, odd man rush, odd man rush. Guys playing out of position. For a guy, for a coach who is a defensive uh, type coach, guys make some ridiculous mistakes. They leave their assignments, leave guys wide open. The, the, the goal the other night, Yerebeck, uh, just jumping right out of his lane, opening everything up for them. Bad changes the other night. Uh, the captain on the third goal starts, started gliding in his own end. There's a break. His two line mates change. He's looking, starts going to the bench, and he realizes, whoo, they're going the other way. And he leans that way, and he says, ah, eh, and he goes right <laughs> to the bench. And the result, goal. I mean, like, that's your captain. And your teammates are seeing that. That's just a, that was a bad choice by a guy who's been in the league for so long. You put your head down, you back check back, you, you get your ass back there as fast as you can. And if you don't catch the play and they score, well, at least your teammates see you doing that. But mm, going to the bench on a play like that, it's just, that, that is, for me, 
unforgivable. <laughs> well, 56 shots against the worst defense in the NHL with their backup goalie. I mean, I'd say the Bell Center has become the place now where visiting teams dress their backup goalie if they have back-to-back -back games. It's and happened several times this season because the Canadians have no offense. And, and then they, the locker room, they say, well, we just ran into a hot goalie. That's right, that's right. All the backup goalies all look like uh, you know, Ken Dryden yeah. or Patrick Waugh when they come to the Bell Center. But yeah, 56 shots, and they say it's three times this year they've had more than 50 shots, and they've lost two of them. It just shows they, they have guys who can get shots, but they don't have enough guys who can finish them. And, and you know, even look at Brendan Gallagher, who's a leading goal scorer. His goal's all coming close. He can't, you know, Brendan usually when he shoots, he's got the head down, he fires. He's not the guy who's going to go in and pick a corner uh, that often. They just, they don't have, the shots are from the perimeter, and Max Pacioretty is about the only guy who can really score from there. And he hadn't, you know, he's got four goals in four, uh, in four games now, but the shots are, are almost meaningless, and, and it just shows it. Yeah, much respect to Brendan Gallagher. He's often been my favorite player on the team, but he shouldn't be the top goal scorer on your team. You know, he's a guy who hustles those types of shots. I mean, you need a real goal scorer. Well, the thing is, it's Gallagher and Byron, their two smallest guys, play like their biggest guys. And, you know, that's where I'm happy to see Nicholas Deloria come in and do well, showing what a big guy can do when he plays like that. Uh, any pleasant surprises on the Canadians for you this season? Thomas Mechanic, you know, everybody had him traded, get him out of here, paying him too much money. Here's a guy who's got the toughest assignments night in and night out. He's like seven points off the lead in scoring. Uh, on this team, uh, you know, he's never going to burn it up offensively again like he did back in the day. But he sure is a, a useful player for this team in a season where, ooh, uh, things are not going good. So, yeah, he gets all the tough assignments, takes them, shuts up, shuts his mouth, does what he has to do to help this team win. Thomas Volcanic for me. For me, it's Jordy Ben and him being this offensive juggernaut that he's turned into this season. That that has been a pleasant surprise, especially a team that's been is having... Is that what you call it? <laughs> <laughs> offensive juggernaut he is? <laughs> well, if you look at the years before, he's never even found the back of the net. So I would say that would be the pleasant surprise for uh -huh. me. Well, you mentioned Placanic. It'll be interesting to see. You, I, I'm pretty sure the Kings are going to trade him by the trade deadline. He'll be a valuable, valuable addition to a team... That needs yeah. that got shut down. Sentiment for me, the surprise of Nicholas Delory, even though he's only been here a little while. Uh, first game I saw him, I looked at him, I thought, well, this guy, <laughs> what's he doing here? And he's just, he, every game he's gotten better. And every game he's got more confident. And he finishes his checks. You notice him every time he's on the ice. And I was happy to see Claude Julien the game promote him and put him up with Drouin and, and Galchenyuk for his shift. And, and, you know, he's a kid. He grew up in Valley Field. It's a home. It's, it's nice to see a guy like that, a homegrown kid, come here and wear the CH with pride. I mean, he talked about how when he wears the sweater, he doesn't want to stock him after the prize. He, I wore the sweater not just for me, but my family and all my friends that I grew up with cheering for the Canadians. So to me, he's been a really pleasant surprise, and I'm happy to see him succeed. Okay, that is our show. We want to thank you all for watching at home. Leave your comments in the comments section below on YouTube and or the Gazette. How would you retool the Canadians if you were the general manager? I'm Adam Susser, and we'll see you back here next Thursday. We'll <laughs>